my son, do not forsake my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. So will you find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Well, that's going to kind of get us into this this morning and what we're doing. But before I jump in there, I was just standing there worshiping. And then I heard a voice behind me that I thought, oh, that sounds familiar. I turned around and uh, there is Jim Frizzell sitting there for the. <laughs> it's good to have you with us, buddy. It's good to have you. We've been we've been praying over the last couple of weekends for Jim. Uh, he was in a uh, motorcycle accident. And so um, the fact that you're here is just I. Kind of gets me a little worked up. Anyway, it's good to see you, buddy. It's good to see you. Well, um, so if you were here last week, you got a little bit of an intro into this. I showed a, another video kind of where I'm going with this. And uh, I'm, first of all, I'm glad you're here for this because we're, you're kind of getting in on the, on the ground floor. Matter of fact, I'm going to encourage you to please be involved with this with us. Uh, it's going to be all dependent on how long-winded I get. It's going to be somewhere between four and six weeks of, of messages. But I want to encourage you to really commit to coming to church over this next month, month and a half, and being here because um, I, I see this not only as a, uh, as a sermon series, we're doing a sermon series, that's cool, but as like a, a new way to kind of think about how we do church. As a matter of fact, at the very end of this, I'm going to challenge you with a question that is a new way for us to think about how we come to church and why we we come to church. So please try to make a commitment to join us with this. If you can't come, you can come online. Matter of fact, hi to all the online people. That's weird. Anyway, um, hi. Um, This is maybe a new way for us to be thinking about church. I showed you a little video last week. I'll give you a little recap of that video and, and share some of the things that have been on our hearts and minds as a staff, especially thinking through this, that really we want to be a church of, I said we want to be a church of generations. And what I mean by that is that older generations are seeing their role to, to pour into younger generations. And not only that, the younger generations, those of you who are young in this church and maybe you haven't been on this planet for that, that long, that you are actually willing and ready to look to older generations for their experience and, and for their wisdom. You're ready to, to receive that. And it's going to be both and. Every time I get up here, we're going to be talking about both and. Sometimes we want to kind of point the finger at everybody else and say, you're the one who's not doing the right thing. And, and, and uh, it's both and. We're going we're gonna to come together in that because in every aspect of our culture right now, and you see this as well as I do, in every aspect of our culture, there is this powerful pull to divide, to, uh, to separate ourselves based on our own, honestly, I'm just going to be straight up with you today, based on our own self-interest. Because I want it a certain way, I want to do things in a certain way, and uh, we're so focused inwardly that we start to divide. And I'm just going to say that the young and old traditionally do not do very well in church together. That's a sad statement to me, but it's true. And this is why you see different uh, people going to different churches, because um, we haven't really grasped this idea of legacy. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he says, um, follow me as I follow the example of Christ, right? In other words, he's not just interested in him following the example of Christ. I mean, that's good. That's important for him to do. But he's also interested in who's coming behind him, on who his legacy is. And I I think that God has something more for us in that. Um, I, I want to, I think we have a chance to be different in the way that we think, in the way that we see church. And so we're going to dig into not only why do we struggle to come together, but how we, could be, we can be different. We can do this in a different way. I want to be, I want to be a collection of Christ followers who's fallen hard after Christ. Yes, not neglect that. But then who actually cares about who's following us, who's, who's coming behind us. 
I think he's ordained it, that older generations would pass wisdom and experience on to younger generations, and younger generations would use their wisdom, use their energy, use their vitality to serve not only the church, but to serve older generations. I think that's how he has it set up, and so we're going to look at that over the coming weeks. I used a quote from William James. He says, the great use of life is to spend it for something that will outlast it. The great use of life is to spend it for something that will outlast it. So I want to be a church that intentionally chooses to spend our lives on something that will outlast it. So uh, the word intentionally is going to be really key for us. We're going to keep coming back to that over and over because if we don't have intentionality with this sort of a thing, it doesn't work. It doesn't just happen naturally. If you look at what happens naturally, what happens naturally is we divide and we go our separate ways. But we're going to be intentional. It's kind of like fighting gravity. If you're going to, gravity is always going to pull things down. If you want to change that, if you want to redirect something, you're going to have to be very intentional and you're going to have to use your strength and your courage to move things in a different direction than the way it's naturally going to go. It has to be purposeful. It has to be purposed. So today what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go back to very, what at first hopefully it will probably seem very basic to you. You'll go like, oh my gosh, we've been here before. We've done that. We've talked about that before. But I want to maybe have you think about it in a brand new way that you've never thought of before. And it's going to start with a very uh, generic sounding question. It's number one on your outline. The question is, what is your purpose? What is your purpose? Um, again, don't pass over this. Don't just go, oh yeah, I've been there, done that, heard that, talked about that, thought about that before. I want you to really think about the answer to this question. What is your purpose? Purpose, by definition, is the reason for which something is done or the reason it is created. Why does it exist? That's, that's purpose. What is your purpose? You know, people have been trying to answer this question for I don't know, since the beginning of time, I assume, I, for millennia at least, people have been trying to figure out what is, what is my purpose. And, and it seems to really throw people off. It gets really confusing for people to answer this question because I think, at least I'm going to pause it this morning, because I think we're framing the question, we're asking the wrong questions when it comes down to purpose. Why is it that we are here? The wrong questions start in the wrong place, and they sound something like, um, what, is, what is my goal? Um, what is my mission? What is my dream for my future? And when you start with questions like that, trying to figure out what your purpose is, when you start with questions like that, you are never going to find your purpose. And let me tell you why. This is, I think this is why we have such a struggle with this. The reason that is the wrong place to start is because you did not create you, okay? You, you didn't create you. So if you're going to you for the answer to the question, what is my purpose, then just right off the bat, you're starting in the wrong place, you're starting with the wrong questions. You didn't create you. So in order to figure out why we were made, why we were built, why we exist, we have to go to the one who created us. We have to start there. We have to start with our creator, right? And again, this might seem just sort of basic level generic, like, okay, but just stick with me on this and really let this question settle into your hearts and minds and souls. If God built you, if God made you, we're told in Psalm 139 that your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. If God built you, if God is the one who is in the scriptures, we say uh, he is knitting you together in your mother's womb. Why did he do that? Why did God create you? Why do you exist? Jeremiah gets to know. God tells Jeremiah exactly why he is here. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you, that I would appoint you as a prophet to the nations. This is what God tells Jeremiah. He says, I got a, I got a purpose for you. I appointed you. I consecrated you from before you were even born. I, I, I created something for you. I have a job. I have a role for you. 
God has that same role, that same purpose, that same idea for every single one of us in this room. As you were being knit together, he was thinking about his purpose. He was thinking about his design. He was wiring you and creating you in such a way so that you would perfectly fulfill that purpose, right? This is why, just a little side note here, this is why I am so strongly, sorry if this offends, I'm so strongly pro-life. Because I believe that from the very beginning, from the very, very beginning, every single human being was being knit together was being wired in such a way that God's purpose would be lived out in their lives. Right? This is why I believe that from the very beginning, God has intentionally, He has planned it so that we would be living out our, our purpose. Every single one of us, every single human being was created for a purpose. We have a reason for our existence. God's reason has to be our reason. Paul gets to know his reason for existence in Galatians chapter 1. He says, but when he who set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, was pleased to reveal Jesus to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. So God says, I got a purpose for you. Before you were even born, before, the, before you even came onto this planet, I had a purpose for you, that you would preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, to the people who would never other he- otherwise hear it. Paul, I'm telling you, this is, this is your purpose. This is maybe one of several purposes, but this is going to be your purpose. When God created you, when God knit you together in your mother's womb, he did so with a purpose in mind. Every single one of you. The only confusing thing about this is when we start to look inwardly for our purpose. When we start to look at ourselves and go, what is my purpose? What is my goal? What is my hope for my future? And we fail to look at the one who created us. Colossians says that all things were created by him and for him. Everything was created by him. He was very intentional. He didn't just like leave us to chance, you know, like, good luck. I hope that one turns out okay. You know, like, like come on, you got it. No, he's, he's, got a, he's got a plan. Man, he's got a plan. He's got a purpose. And you can't find your real purpose if you, keep, if you start with yourself. If you begin with you, then you're going to mess it up every single time. And some of you, I think, man, the moment you could understand this, the moment you could really grab onto this understanding that your purpose has to be God's purpose, I think you're going to find a lot of what you're looking for in this life. Because sometimes you know, we're walking around with no purpose. We're walking around with no direction. Young and old, doesn't really matter. Um, all over the map, we don't really know. We're looking at our lives going, what am I doing here? Why am I so unfulfilled? Why does it feel like I'm not even making any headway? Why does it feel like my walk of faith is always getting strung, strung back to the beginning? Why, we, why does it feel like I don't have any purpose? Maybe because your days are busy, you're full, but, the, but what you're filling yourself with is not fulfilling. It, it's, not, it's, not, it's not God's purpose for you. It's your purpose for yourself. That makes sense. But it's not God's purpose for you. I think if you could figure that out, if you could say, what, what is my purpose? What is God? Why did God create me? Then all of a sudden, the fullness of your days could actually be fulfilling. They could actually be fulfilling. It's only in God that we discover our purpose, uh, our significance. Um, every other path is just kind of a dead end. I, I talk about this analogy a lot because to me, in my mind, it just makes a lot of sense that we take our bucket and we put it down in a well, poof, but the well is dry. And so every single time we keep putting our bucket down into the well, and then we start pulling it back up, it's going to come up empty every time. We have to figure out what the right source is. So when you look to God, you're going to see that your purpose is very rarely inwardly focused. It is almost always outwardly focused. As a matter of fact, I put this for you on your sermon notes so that you would have it. Um, I think it's on the back top. God's purpose. Let's figure out what this is. God's purpose. God's purpose is to recreate this fallen world, redeem a people for himself who will glorify him and share his glory. That's God's purpose, ultimate big picture purpose, that God is redeeming this fallen world and he is redeeming a people who will not only glorify him, but will someday eventually share in that glory. And so when we realize that that's God's purpose, that's God's purpose, he is redeeming this planet, he is redeeming people, then what we do is say, okay, we need to make our purpose God's purpose. So we don't look to ourselves for that purpose, we look at God's purpose. This becomes our purpose. This becomes our drive. The redemption of this fallen world, the redeeming of people to himself that we might give him glory. We get to be a part, this is amazing to me, that the God who created, and he could just 
boom, snap his fingers, clap his hands, whatever, and everything would be taken care of. But he doesn't do that. What he says instead is he says, hey, here's my purpose. I want to redeem the fallen world. I want to redeem people and draw them to myself so they might bring me glory. And, and he says, and I want, this is crazy, and I want you to participate in that with me. Yeah, I could just do it. I guess God could just do it. He says, no, 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 I got something better than that. I'm going to give you a chance. Every single one of you, a chance to redeem, be a part of the redemption of this world. Every single one of us, we're a part of that. That becomes our, our purpose. He says, my plan to redeem the world is also your plan. This is what you're going to be a part of. And when we get that, then God's purpose becomes this driving force in our life. Number two, on your outline, what is the driving force in your life? Uh, it's a little different question. It sounds kind of the same, but it's a little different question. You think about the things that you drive. You know, you drive a, a car. You drive a nail. Uh, you drive a golf ball. How many people like golf? Is that okay? okay, good. I used to like golf. I liked it until, I'll just tell you a quick story. There's nothing spiritual about this lesson, except maybe there is. I was golfing with a friend in Lake Almanor. So hit the ball. And uh, it goes, shanks off and hits a house. And my buddy kind of gets mad at me. He's like, Paul, you're not supposed to hit the houses. I'm like, oh, man, I know I'm not supposed to hit the houses, but I, I don't know what I'm doing. So he's like, and so I get the second ball, I put it down, and I, I swing it. Hits the same exact house a second time. He's like, Paul, you're not supposed to hit the houses. He got up, I'm like, oh. anyway, that's my golf story. That's why I don't, that's why I don't golf much anymore um, after that traumatic event. You think about the things that you drive. These are things that you're trying to guide and you're trying to direct. You're trying to guide and direct it in a certain way. Often, if it's a golf ball, it totally goes a different direction than you want to guide it or direct it. But what is driving? What is like directing, guiding your life right now? What is that? So number one, what is your purpose? But then number two, what is like pushing you toward your purpose? What is driving you toward your purpose? It could be a lot of different things. I started just trying to make a list. Obviously, I started, already said self-interest. Self-interest drives a lot of our decisions, a lot of the things that we do. A lot of, That makes sense, and it's not all wrong. I'm not trying to put that on us. We, we all have that desire to be, um, to be fulfilled and to uh, be safe, those sorts of things. So self-interest isn't always bad, but sometimes we're driven by um, guilt, I think, maybe drives a lot of people. Um, what other people think about us is probably a big, a big driver. Um, sometimes like things like resentment and anger and pain uh, drive us to do different things, make different decisions. Maybe it's a, a need for approval. What is your purpose? And then what is driving you toward that purpose? Before we really can jump into this Generations Project, we have to clarify these answers. We have to see this because otherwise everything I do, everything I talk about up here, if we don't have our purpose and our drive down, everything that I talk about, it's just not going to make any sense. You're going to say things like, well, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to take that step? Why would I want to be involved in that? Because um, I, I think because maybe our, our purpose, our, our drive, are not coming from the right place. They're coming from a desire for the wrong things. Uh, I'll never forget, Carol and I, we both taught at the same school. We, didn't, we weren't there at the same exact time, but when we lived in Lake Almanor, we taught at this place called Chester Junior Senior High School. It was a junior senior high school. It was a small little town. And uh, I left. I got involved in youth ministry. Carol came. She was teaching there for a while. And I'll never forget this big kerfuffle happened on, uh, all, it, I mean, it went, it was all over social media at first. And then the little local newspaper grabbed onto his little tiny com community. Um, what happened was somebody, somebody decided that it was time to clear out the old trophy cabinet. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, because that's a big deal, man. I was surprised. People got amped up about this. They were like all over. I mean, it was like a big thing, big yelling, screaming matches at town hall meetings and all this sort of thing. Like, you can't get rid of, you know, this. And it was kind of interesting to me. I was doing youth ministry at the time, so I was hearing about it a lot, but I wasn't really involved. But thank God I did not make that bad decision. Um, but uh, just kind of watching all this. And what was interesting to me was to see how for so many people, all those old uh, accomplishments, 
they were still like breathing. They still had so much life to them. It was kind of like Uncle Rico from uh, Napoleon Dynamite. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like this, like I'm living in this moment, man. If, if coach would have put me in at the last quarter of the game, I would have thrown out, you know, like living in this moment in their past. And, and, and there was just this big thing. I'm not blaming them. They, uh, maybe they were right on saying they shouldn't have gotten rid of those. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying the, the passion with which people hold on to those things. James, James Dobson, he once said, he said, uh, given enough time, someone will eventually throw away your trophies. I don't care how awesome it was in 1976. <laughs> your trophies will eventually go away. One of the most short-sighted things that we can do is we can invest our time, invest our energy, invest our money, invest our lives into things that do not last. We can pretend that those things have eternal value when they do not. And we take everything that we are and everything that we want to be and we invest them into things that have absolutely no eternal value, no eternal purpose. I could quote uh, the moth and rust thing here, but I think you see exactly what I'm saying. You were created with a higher purpose than the now. You were created to live now, to have an impact on eternity. You were created to have an impact on then. The only way that happens is when your purpose becomes God's purpose. When your purpose is to be a part of what God is doing to recreate this planet and to redeem a people for himself, for his glory, and to glorify him. C.S. Lewis says that all, things that all that is not eternal is eternally useless. All that is not eternal is eternally useless. God wants us to be a part of this with him. It, it's a purpose that will last not only eternal, eternally, it'll, it'll prepare us for Eternity, everything else is temporal. It won't last. So back to where we started off, William James, the great use of life is to spend it for something that will outlast it, that we start to invest in treasures that will, that will last. So this is, you see what I'm doing? Kind of starting to lay a foundation for all of us to have the, a common language here, for us to be talking in the same way, in the same direction. I want you to open your Bibles to Judges chapter 2, if you have it. Judges chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 7 to 10. This has been a verse that I, I heard about it when I was, or I read it when I was first in, uh, in youth ministry. Somebody showed it to me. That was really interesting. It's kind of, through the years, has just come back and, and stuck with me, and I've used it at different times and thought about it at different times. This is just after the entry into the promised land. Um, remember, they were wandering around, the Israelites were wandering around in the desert, to kind of put us into context here. Uh, after the Exodus, wandering around the desert 40 years, Joshua eventually ushers them over the Jordan River, getting into the promised land, and uh, Joshua will eventually go on to die course, like everybody. And so this is kind of a picture of his death and a quick little thing that happens. So Judges chapter 2 verse 7, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. So, so these people, they are faithful to God. They're, they're, it's a great generation. They served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And then even the people who outlived Joshua, they were still talking about the great things that God had done. Right? Or they at least had witnessed the great things that God had done. But we're going to see, actually, they may not have been talking about it that much. Verse 8, And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gosh. Verse 10, and all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. So the rest of that older generation died. They're gathered to their fathers. They're gone. And listen to the very next line in verse 10. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. To me, I just feel like it's such a heartbreaking verse. What happened here? Because you have a, a faithful generation of people. They, they, they served the Lord. They, they, knew the, they knew what God had done for them. What happened here to, to have this last line, and there rose another generation who did not know the Lord, who 
not, nor any of the work that God had done for Israel. I'll tell you, I think two things happened, and this will really get us on the ground with the Generations Project, and we'll wrap it up. I think two things happened. One, I think you had uh, an older generation that was so focused internally. Maybe they were focused on their own walks with God because they were a faithful people. I don't, I don't know exactly what they're focused on, but they were so focused internally that they were not paying attention to God's bigger purpose of the redemption of this world and the redemption of people. They were focused on their own purposes. The Bible says that they served the Lord all the days of Joshua. They, they, uh, they, were, they saw the great work that he had done for Israel. They were a faithful people, but somehow, some way, they did not pass that on. They just didn't pass it on. They were not paying attention, as Paul said, to the, to the ones who were following him. They weren't, weren't paying attention to that, about the people who would come after him. That's, that's the first thing that happened. But every single time I talk this time, I'm going to say this is a two-pronged approach. We've got to come together on this. But there's something else that happened. There was a younger generation that somehow was not interested in learning about God's purposes. Maybe somebody would try to talk about it, but it fell on deaf ears. People didn't really care about the stories. The younger generation did not care about the stories of what God had done for Israel. It's both and. It's, a, it's an older generation who somehow did not take it as a priority to pass on a legacy of faith, and it's a younger generation that somehow did not take it as a priority to receive a legacy of faith from an older generation. And what happened then is you have this entire generation that does not know the Lord. They don't know the great things that God had done for Israel. It was not passed on to them. God's purpose, remind you of this, is to recreate the fallen world and to redeem a people for himself who will glorify him and share his glory. Number three, you are part of that. You are part of the redemption story. You're part of it. God wants to use every single one of us, just like he used, we've been studying Peter, just like he used Peter and Matthew and James and Paul and Samaritan woman at the well and, 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 and Rahab the prostitute. I mean, anybody who uh, adopts the purpose of God. So why am I created, God? What do you need me to do? What part do you need me to play? Everyone who does that is going to be used by God as part of his redemption story. Psalm 107, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Right before that, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for, the, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. In, le- in other words, we have an opportunity and an obligation to speak up. We have an obligation to speak up. You are, were created with purpose. Your purpose is to participate with God in the redemption of the planet. His eyes saw your unformed substance before you were born, before your days were even lived out. He saw them. You are part of the story of redemption. I'll, I'll help us maybe put a fine point on this, and then I've got a little video to, show, to wrap it up. Purpose. I'll ask you a question. Uh, this is a little kind of mean question, but you're okay. You'll, you'll be able to handle it. Here we go. Um, the question is, why did you come to church today? Um, just something for you to think about. Why did you come to church today? I think for me, most of the time when I was sitting out there, and, and even often sometimes when I'm up here, um, I would say something like, man, I, I came to, to worship. I came to be fed by the Word of God. It's not wrong. That's good. Um, uh, if you're here for that reason, I'm glad you're here. I'm really glad you're here. Um, but I want to challenge you that there's something beyond that. If you came for the purpose of being fed and your thoughts never once turned to the purpose that God has you here to feed, I think you're missing at least a part of God's purpose. If you are not seeing yourself as a part of the redemption of people, if you're not part of that process, then everything is going to be about you. Everything is going to be about meeting your needs. Everything is going to be about feeding you. We have to adopt God's purpose and start looking out. It has to be external. When we started uh, this whole idea and started giving birth to this Generations Project idea, we started thinking about families in the church that were passing on a legacy of faith. 
And um, there's we're kind of amazed the number of people in this congregation who are worshiping with their families like three generations deep. So you have grandparents worshiping with their adult children, and then you have the grandkids here. And so it's kind of amazing. We came up with 25, maybe 30 families in this church, and that's just the ones that we could count that we knew of that were worshiping that way, which is an amazing picture. I don't know if it's like that everywhere in Montana. It's, it was never like that in my context in, in Lake Almanor. And so it's a pretty cool thing. So we started sitting down with some of these families and just asking them a question to kind of help share, what is this, this conversation about a legacy of faith? Can you share that with us? And so the first family, family we started with was the Pierce family. Some of you know uh, Ronnie Pierce. Ronnie Pierce was a, a pastor at Swan Chapel for 29 years. Uh, he was a chaplain for another 40 some odd years. He's been married to his wife, Carol, for 65 years uh, they, they, he said, they, we've known each other for 70, though. We've been hanging out with each other for a long time. Okay. So we just ask him to just share a little bit about this legacy of faith. So I'll turn it over to, to them. Well, Carol and I talk a lot. Pastor Paul about how blessed we are with our kids and their families and their spouses. Uh, I mean, it's just, they, they're just wonderful. I think I've found that, well, besides being back home after being away for 30 years, that it, it's special attending together because when we were growing up and you were pastoring, we didn't sit together. He's in the pulpit, she's on the organ, sometimes I'm on the piano or sitting out, you know, I mean, we were just, and that's that was normal to us, I mean, being pastor's kids, but it's different now sitting together, together listening to the sermon and just, yeah, and like he said, we almost always go to one of our houses for lunch or go out to eat and just have some family time dedicated on Sundays. That's just, you know, that's kind of become, become our thing and it's, it's nice. You look at uh, Sunday as kind of a, a time to get together and just, and we usually go eat somewhere afterwards or, you know, just spend some time together because we, uh, even though we're living close, we, everybody's busy, you know. And, and uh, so we just, uh, well, like I said, Carol and I feel blessed with our family. I actually see the f foundational aspects, you know, they're, they're so real now of, of why, sometimes I wonder why I am where I'm at in uh, my relationship with God. And it always goes back to, you know, how we grew up, how we were raised. and. Uh, because it wasn't my good choices that put me where I'm at. It's more of what they you know, raised them up and in the right way. And that's where they will. You return. So I kind of made my full circle once or twice. Yeah, but that's, like I told Jim Bob one time, I, I'd like to have redone some of the things in my younger years that I did that weren't pleasing to my parents. but. That's in the past, you know, and, and that's the forgiveness that, that's in Jesus, and I'm thankful for that, I'll tell you. When we came back, uh, we were staying with them and didn't know what we were going to do for sure, and so we ended up living, we thought we were going to be there for a few weeks. We were there six months, and they were very kind about that. Closer than a year, I think. Oh, it was, it was not. It was six months. And, and we even loved them while they were there. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's definitely a privilege and a blessing to me. And I have been part of the family for 34 years. But even before then, my family moved here 43 years ago. And the, we started attending Swan Chapel when Ron was the pastor there. And I was able to help Carol with... <clears throat> Vacation Bible School, and so I was I was part of that family down there before we were a family. So it feels really full circle to me. I went there, Ron's married my sister, my nephew, buried my brother, my mother, my and my and my um, 
father, so just been a lot. Married you? Married us, yes. yes. <laughs> I really, really was happy when she got into our family because we just kind of, kind of clicked and we did things together and this and that. And, and then finally got to this girl getting back, so we're happy. <laughs> Church is, to me anyway, in our relationship with, with my parents, isn't, I mean, church is a place that we're we're together and, and we uh, make it a point to be there and it's important, but most of what I, you know, get, you know, from our late relationship and relationship with God comes from, you know, watching them and have watched them never, never waver. I mean, walk in the walk, talk in the talk. And that's not, that's sadly enough in today, that's not a very common. And, you know, that's one thing that it's always been, to me, I've been very proud of is, you know, dad's exactly who everybody sees he is and who he should be. It's really a blessing to me because I didn't have that growing up. Um, I had a very religious mother. I started in the Baptist church when I was like six years old. But my dad never went to church. So I got it all just from my mother's side. And I didn't, I, this is just, the, the warmth in this family is so great. I just really enjoy it. And it's, it's been a blessing to me. I can glean a lot of their wisdom from that I've missed through the years. <laughs> because you've forgotten more than I'll ever know. No. You're 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 fine, Jim Ball. <laughs> oh, I'll be fine. Yeah, it's because you guys raised me. <laughs> right. I would like to take some credit for that too. Well, I did. <laughs> Serena says, I'd like to take some credit for that, too. Yeah, it's good. Why don't you do me a favor? Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> do me a favor and stand to your feet. I'm just going to ask you two questions as we close out. Um, the first is, maybe just work on this all week long. Who is watching you live out your faith? Who is watching you live out your faith? And the second one is, who are you watching live out their faith? Well, maybe those two, when we start to answer these questions, I, I want, by the time we finish this thing, I want to have names right in those slots. That you know people are watching you live out your faith, and you are also watching people. You're walking with people who are living out their faith. Amen? Let me close this. God, thank you for this time together in your word and in really thinking about how we can navigate this planet, navigate this life better, and it has to do with us coming together, not with us going apart. God, I pray that you would just give us a vision for your church that spans generations, that we look to you for our purpose and we recognize that you have placed us here. Matter of fact, you have placed us right in the row in front of or right in the row behind or right next to someone right now who needs to be able to hear a legacy of faith being passed down. God, you've designed it this way. We get to participate with you in the redemption of this fallen world, and I believe that it starts right here in the church. This is the plan. So we thank you for this community. We thank you for the blessing that you are to us. I pray, God, over each and every person as they go about their day that you would... Um, just remind them of your grace, mercy, and forgiveness. I pray this through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right. Hey, thanks again for being here this morning. If you haven't been baptized, just get it done already, okay? <laughs> Next week, sign up. Thanks for being here. We'll see you.